but I think enough people are probably in the room that we can start. Um, so uh, welcome, my name is Naomi Shapiro. Um, I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner and a professor of merit, uh, so that's sort of retired from the UCSF School of Nursing. Uh, and I'm one of the presenters today. We're gonna all introduce ourselves in just a minute. Um, we're really happy to uh, welcome you to the ACES Aware Listening and Learning Session. Just, and I see a lot of old friends, so that's great, and a lot of, a lot of other folks here. Um, so, um, just to say here that we have no commercial disclosures and that this uh, presentation is funded through the ACES Aware Initiative, um, this particular one through uh, ETR and California School Health Association. Um, and then I am also funded through the UCSF Institute for Health Policy Studies for uh, kind of a separate engagement uh, pro uh, project, which I won't really go into today, but just so, so you know, that's what our funding is. And um, wanted to just go over ground rules and then we'll introduce ourselves. Um, so just in terms of Zoom, folks, most folks know this, but you know, you never always, always helps to remind, please mute when you're not speaking. Um, you can use the chat function to chime into discussion or ask a question at any time and everybody's watching chat. Um, rename yourself to, uh, to include pronouns next to your name. I'm not sure that's possible. It wasn't possible for me, but if it's possible for you, please do that. Uh, just because we're in a, it's not our own Zoom, we're in somebody else's Zoom. Um, and in terms of operating agreements to remember that uh, this is a confidential space, so we should not be uh, reporting gossip about what we've heard. Um, one diva, one mic. So when we get into the, we're gonna do breakout rooms. And when we get into those breakout rooms, uh, one person talks at a time. Um, uh, people may have heard of step up and step back. We have a new uh, way to talk about that, which is move up and move up. Meaning if you are not somebody who doesn't speak a lot, please move up and speak. We wanna hear your voice. And if you're somebody who speaks a lot, we want you to move up to listening and enjoy what it's like to listen some of the times that you might actually rather be speaking, um, to be curious about what we and everybody else are doing. Uh, any other suggestions about ground rules? Think about them, put them in the chat, and then we're gonna ask you more individually when we get into our breakout rooms, because we'll review them again. Um, and now, I'm gonna stop share for a minute. We're all gonna introduce ourselves. I think I've already introduced myself, so the rest of the folks who are co-hosts will introduce. I can go first. I'm Victoria Keaton. I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner and a clinical uh, professor at UCSF in the School of Nursing. My clinical practice is with La Clinica de la Raza, a community organization here in the Bay Area and um, I practice at one of the middle schools in the school-based health department. Um, I also um, am a doctoral student at UC Davis in the School of Nursing, and my uh, area of research is in maternal stress and impacts on child emotional health. I can go next. I'm Jessica Dyer, the Behavioral Health Director with the California School-Based Health Alliance. I'm so glad that all of you are here and in and attending, and pass it on to uh, Stephanie. I'm Stephanie Guinoso. I'm a senior research associate at ETR, which stands for Education, Training, and Research. And we're partners with the California School-Based Health Alliance and uh, Naomi Shapiro and Victoria Keaton um, on this ACES Aware uh, Professional Learning Collaborative, which you'll learn more about. And I'll pass it over to Kelly. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Kelly Whitaker. I'm a senior research associate at ETR Associates also. Um, I do research on school-based health centers related to implement, implementing um, programs as well as um, evaluation and research on the impact of school-based health centers on health and mental health outcomes. Next, Susanna. Hi everyone, I'm Susanna. I'm a project coordinator at ETR and I evaluate school-based health and wellness programs at San Francisco Unified School District. So just wanted to, I'm going to turn this over to Victoria for, for a bit, um, but before we do that, we just wanted to remind you, somebody's going to put the application for the learning collaboratives into the chat 
and we'll repeat that later and we'll talk about it quite a bit more in the breakout groups. But just in case you already know this is something you're interested in applying for, um, we want to just have the link there. Okay, great. So we just thought we'd start by getting a little feel for, you know, who's in the, the virtual room, if you will. Um, so if you can go ahead and check your chat, there is a link to poll everywhere. So if you can take a minute to click on that, you can log in either from your phone or your computer. And I will go ahead and share my screen so we can all um, look at some of this together. So um, the first question is really just to help us um, keep track of everyone who's here today uh, because of how many people are registered for the conference. We weren't able to link your presence here um, to, to this uh, particular meeting. So this is actually a, um, private just between us. We're not going to be sharing this information, but if you can take a minute to enter your name and email address. Um, that this will also help us follow up with you if you are interested in the in joining the learning collaborative, uh, which we'll talk about. And I'll just give it a couple more minutes. Oh, great. We've got a lot of people here. This is so exciting. <laughs> Okay, I think we've heard from everybody. Um, so I'll go ahead and move on. If you didn't get a chance to, um, feel free to chat me privately and we can add your name to the list. Um, okay, so now the next ones are a couple of just easy questions. So what is your current role uh, associated with school-based health? And hopefully we've covered all the options, but <laughs> choose the one that closest describes your, your primary role in school-based health. Great. All right. A lot of diversity in the group. That's wonderful. A lot of representation from uh, administration and school staff, which is fantastic. And then a lot of spread between different types of providers and clinicians. Welcome, everyone. We really look forward to hearing from so many different perspectives that really are going to uh, shape this work going forward. So if you are uh, currently affiliated with a particular health center, are you open? <laughs> uh, this is a big question and we know it varies widely. So, um, and some of you might be doing some sort of variation, maybe just telehealth. Okay, so about half and half. Um, about three quarters are open in some way, which is reassuring. Um, but I think, you know, I'm, I'm with a quarter of you in that my health center is closed and um, we're really hoping to get back soon. Um, but it's good to know, we'll, we'll be talking a little bit today about the use of telehealth and implications for sort of how to do this work in the telemedicine world. So really great to know that a lot of people have some experience with that. Okay, if you are affiliated with a health center, are you currently screening for ACEs? All right, great. So a lot of diversity of expertise in the room. This is gonna be fantastic. So we were really, Looking forward to this, having some, some ex experts, people who have been trying this out to be able to give their perspectives and then um, for others to you know, learn and also convey you know, our thoughts, concerns, hopes, et cetera. So wonderful, thank you. And then we'll finish by just finding out, why are you here? What are some things that you'd like to get from today?
All right. Well, great news. You're in the right place. <laughs> I think we'll be able to tackle a lot of this. So this is really great. People are really interested in ACEs in general. How do we do this in schools? Uh, what are the, the pieces about billing? Um, and thinking about sort of how to use ACEs and that information. So wonderful. How are we going to use the results? Excellent. All right, thank you. I'm going to stop sharing and let uh, Naomi get started with our presentation, but I, I, um, I'm going to flip back to the name and email. So if you didn't get a chance to respond to that, you can go ahead and do that on the side. Thanks. Okay, so we are um, getting back to just getting us all on the same page. I'm sure that some of you have a lot of knowledge and experience around ACEs and others. It's a relatively newer concept. So just to make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, the initiative, the ACEs Aware Initiative is led by the Office of the California Surgeon General, Nadine Brooke Harris, and the Department of Healthcare Services to give Medi-Cal providers training clinical protocols and payment for screening children and adults for ACEs. So um, for folks who are already Medi-Cal providers, that is a, a great addition to what you can bill for. We'll talk about what the billing is in just a minute. Um, and um, there's actually a variety of institutions and organizations that can become Medi-Cal billers for the purposes of ACEs billing. And, um, uh, so this is a kind of a brand new law that, uh, that, that allows us to do this billing. This is really brand new practice. It wasn't really, people have been doing ACEs screening for a while, but it wasn't billable as a separate additional screening in addition to everything else they did. So as of January 1st, 2020, the California Department of Healthcare Services does reimburse all uh, providers of all children and adults on Medi-Cal. $29 per ACEs approved screenings and then uh, related stress screens. So they have to be approved by the state of California, the particular ACEs screening. For children, zero to 21, that is yearly per provider and practice. So that means that if you, for example, are in a particular practice and your parents um, move to another part of the state, the new practice can rescreen you in the same year or if you go to a specialist, for some reason, they are also doing ACEs screening, which some of them are, they could screen you. Um, and then adults from 21 and up, so over 21 years in one day, uh, would be once per provider or practice. So you're, you have a primary care provider, they can screen you once in your lifetime with them. Uh, you are somebody who gets pregnant and goes to a different practice for prenatal care, they could screen you because it's a different practice. Um, and then, uh, so this was pretty free floating and free form from January to July. By July 1st, providers who bill for screening will have to attest that they have taken the required training. Um, and you attest using your NPI number, which would be your personal uh, provider number for folks like physicians, nurse practitioners, midwives. Um, and then there are practice NPI numbers as well that people can bill under. So it isn't just, you know, it is a variety of primary care providers and specialty providers. It's also a variety of mental health providers, but there are actually a lot of other categories of folks who can bill for ACEs screening. And so on this slide, we've given you a whole bunch of helpful links that you can click on at another time to learn more about this, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> including to get to the screening. So the, I just wanted to clarify for folks who might not have heard of uh, adverse childhood experiences. Um, this concept uh, came out of a very large retrospective study at Southern California Kaiser that Validi, who was a healthcare provider, primary care adult provider, um, and Anda uh, started, supported by the Center for Disease Control. Um, and they, they did surveyed 17,000 adults seeking preventive care who were queried about a variety of childhood adversities. 
um, they discovered that 22% of the sample had been sexually abused as children, and the majority had not ever discussed this with their adult provider. Um, and out of that study came 10 different adverse experiences, which are sort of in small print, but you'll be able to blow up in your own screen later. Um, so a variety of household challenges like domestic violence, substance abuse, mental illness, parental separation, divorce, and incarcerated parent, uh, various kinds of abuse, emotional, physical, and sexual abuse, and both emotional and physical neglect. And they found that the more of these adverse childhood experiences folks had, the higher the level of adverse outcomes, you know, from drug, drug abuse and suicide, but also um, all different kinds of chronic conditions like lung disease and diabetes, heart disease. Um, and people were more likely to develop these conditions whether or not they did things like smoke or take drugs or you know, other sort of behaviors that we would think might hasten chronic conditions. So 67% um, uh, of the population have at least one ACE. There, this pyramid that was, you can see on the slide um, shows uh, at the bottom of the pyramid adverse childhood experiences and at the top disease, disability, social problems, and early death. And we know um, that, for example, people with six or more ACEs can die 20 years before folks who have no ACEs. Um, what we are, and that's really got very, very strong epidemiological evidence. What we're not as sure about are all the steps in between on the pyramid. And these are kind of assumed or thought to be true, but there's really a lot of ongoing research. And we're not exactly sure, for example, how to go from a lot of adverse experiences to what you know, to these really poor outcomes in adulthood and what we can do in childhood to actually mitigate or prevent um, more ACEs. Um, and so here's just a little bit more detail about that. Um, and these are odds ratios associated with over four ACEs. Um, we also know that ACEs tend to cluster together. So if you have one or two, it is actually likely that you'll have more than those a few ACEs. And this slide shows the annual cost of ACEs to folks in California, to the California budget. So it's $112.5 billion would be the annual cost in healthcare costs, excess healthcare costs. Uh, so there was a strong financial incentive for the state to try to do something about this, to mitigate it, to try to figure out if there's a way to prevent some of these health outcomes. And it shows kind of even though we're in a pretty difficult time in the state budget and we're in a very difficult time with COVID, um, that the state has kind of forged ahead with actually the uh, reimbursement and training around ACEs. Uh, in terms of childhood, there's been a number of studies done. Um, and um, they, um, I just have to, Bring up my slide so I can see what number I'm on. Um, so um, uh, this kind of shows that uh, this is a study, a population level study of 68th grade children, I think in Canada. And it shows that uh, the number of ACEs is correlated with BMI um, and also with average waist circumference. Um, and this study was done in 2013. It's actually been combined with a number of other studies that are going to continue to follow children from all these studies into adulthood. And so that's starting to go on. Um, and then um, in terms of its impact on urban youth, there's a retrospective chart review that Nadine Burke Harris did of 701 patients at Bayview Child Health Center. In addition to BMI, they found that um, the higher the ACEs score and the higher a community trauma score that she also administered um, the higher the extent of learning and behavior problems. And it was really a dramatic difference between children who had zero um, ACEs and children who had you know, more than four ACEs um, in this particular study. So I think I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and Victoria's gonna share. Okay, great. So, so we know what ACEs are. We know that there are some health outcomes associated. What's the pathway between the two? So the working theory is really focused a lot on stress and trauma and um, uh, both, you know, physiologic effects and also mental health effects 
uh, from that stress and trauma. So when we're talking about, particularly about toxic stress, so that sort of prolonged stress, uh, often people will use the you know example of um, fight or flight or freeze, right? Our sort of body's response to acute stress that um, a lot of physiologic processes come into play and mental processes come into play to sort of keep us on alert, to protect ourselves, to allow us to get through the stress. And then we're meant to go back, you know, get back to an equilibrium. So sort of go back to our baseline or, or what we call allostasis. Uh, for some individuals, that that doesn't ever happen, right? So there's a chronic stress exposure that um, can, you know, leave us in that stress response for a prolonged period. And over time, that can become maladaptive, meaning that it has, uh, it can have some negative health outcomes. Uh, however, for some individuals, if there is, you know, what we call sort of a buffering or supportive, you know, protective mechanism in between, and particularly for children, usually that's an, a, a supportive adult relationship, that that can sometimes mitigate some of the, um, the impact of that toxic stress. So, um, so the definition of toxic stress is this sort of prolonged activation of the stress response system in the absence of a, a buffering protection or supportive relationship. Now, one thing to point out is um, to really make sure that, you know, this doesn't mean that there is no caregiver present. Very often there is a caregiver present and uh, they may have, you know, their own experience of stress or trauma that they are working through and their, their ability to provide protection and support could be uh, limited or impacted, or perhaps there are, you know, feelings of hopelessness or um, a lack of control or autonomy to, to feel like they can actually address this um, with, with their child. On the intervention side, the things that we um, are trying or are trying to, you know, intervene um, to support families and kind of uh, developing that protective uh, buffer are, you know, empathy and compassion first and foremost. Um, so making sure that uh, family or caregivers are feeling empowered, understood, um, and uh, facilitated and sort of having autonomy. Um, and then a lot of education um, with, with communities in general, with individuals and families about the, the impact of trauma, how these things are related to our, you know, physiologic processes, and then moving into the strategies that we can do to sort of cope and, um, and support. Uh, that's kind of more at the individual or family level. When we look at the bigger picture, there are a lot of systemic things that we can do either to try and prevent ACEs from happening and or to create system-wide buffers um, for children and their families. This would be things like policy change or other supports in the community. So from a physiologic standpoint, there are numerous things that we know stress can, uh, how stress can impact health. So first looking at the neurobiology, so these are you know, both cognitive and neurodevelopmental effects. Uh, this is where I think we have a real, real importance in thinking about the school environment, right? So it's very clear that there is potential for uh, academics and school performance um, or school relationships and school interactions to all be affected by this. Uh, so really, really important uh, kids might have, you know, difficulty concentrating, problems learning or laying down memories, um, problems uh, making or sustaining friendships. Um, so there, there can be a lot of impact just on the brain. If we look at the rest of the body, there's also multiple systems affected. And again, a lot of this uh, tends to point back to a sort of inflammatory process. Uh, perhaps an overactivation of the immune system, which again, in short bursts in acute periods are meant to be protective and help us get through stress. But over, over time can really do some detriment to our bodies. And I always think, you know, particularly of our kids that come into the health center often with, you know, headaches or stomach aches or, you know, things that we used to attribute a lot to, you know, sort of psychosomatic uh, uh, complaints or, or origins when we know now that, that the physiologic stress response actually could be producing some of these effects as well. So while we do have a lot of good um, research looking at trauma interventions or interventions um, for people who have experienced acute or chronic traumas, we, ha we know less about ACEs, particularly in children. So we're sort of still on the, the forefront of, of this area. Um, so we don't have as much research to support 
how particular interventions are impacting youth or these particular health outcomes, uh, but we're working on it. And I think part of the work that we're doing here uh, might uh, inform that in the future. And I'll go back to Naomi. Trying to get my screen over, sorry. Okay. Um, so for children and adolescents, um, oh wait, there's another one here. Okay, so one of the reasons that the additional social determinants of health and poverty related questions have been added are that um, you know, it's realized for a lot of people, for a lot of young people, some of these stresses can be actually as or more impactful as um, things like physical abuse or sexual abuse. Um, so, and, and there have been some studies showing that. So we, um, uh, Wade was a researcher who did, um, who's actually involved in that longitudinal study of children from Canada, but, but was involved in a study of young adults in North Philadelphia. And they first asked them about what the greatest stresses were in their life. And then they showed them the ACEs, uh, you know, the list of ACEs and asked what they thought about them. And these young adults stated that watching their parents stress over finances every month was much more traumatic than physical abuse. And they pointed out that a lot of their parents were never married. So it wasn't actually divorce that was the stressor. It was living with a single parent who was really under this kind of stress all the time and really empathizing with that parent and worrying about that parent. Um, uh, Samira Salamanpour and I did a preliminary screen looking at screening for trauma and um, uh, we found that uh, we had youth actually do focus groups and talk about some of the traditional trauma screens in children and what they thought about the screens and they talked about um, they saw things like being on guard which can be a symptom of PTSD as being a survival skill um, that sleep difficulties in a house that was not necessarily that safe or really crowded might just be that they were in a really crowded house that was pretty noisy and people coming in late at night from work. Um, and that, uh, you know, one of the questions was about fighting and they said, well, you know, am I fighting because I want to or am I fighting because I have to? And they saw that, you know, the ability to not back down from a fight was protective for them. So that makes it much more complicated to look at you know, what their awareness is of things that actually might be chronic stressors to them and what skills they feel like they need to hold on to as protective. So we have a lot to learn about some of the additional community violence issues and community social determinants of health. And that's one reason it's pretty exciting that they're actually included in the state sponsored ACE screening that we're gonna be, that you can get reimbursed for. So here they are, here's, here's kind of more detail about the screens. So there's a screening called PEARLS, which is Pediatric ACEs Screening and Related Life Events Screener. And this is really still being studied, actually, in a study at Children's Oakland, um, that this is the screen that's been approved by the state for reimbursement. And um, there can be additional screeners approved, but you have to submit them. Um, I'm going to show you the two screens in, in a minute, but you can do this PEARLS as an identified screen or as a de-identified screen. So um, before we show you the, all the questions, um, the identified screen would mean that you would go over each ACEs and you'd ask the child or the parent to check off which ACEs apply to them, um, which means that if they check off things like physical or sexual abuse, you're um, obligated to do a report with a family that you might not have really met or gotten to know or trust yet. Um, and there are advantages in terms of safety and there are some disadvantages making a report on a family that you have never really developed a relationship with. So um, that is why actually the, the ACEs Aware Project actually recommends if you're doing routine screening, um, you always wanna know if kids are safe, but they actually are recommending for routine screening that you would do a de-identified screen. So you would show a parent or child all of the ACEs and then all of the community stress issues and ask them to say how many apply to them. You know, so instead of checking yes, no on each one, say out of these 10 ACEs, um, how many apply to you? 
Um, and then the idea is that you would then have a trauma-informed discussion with that family or that child. And out of that discussion, you would, you know, would want to ask about safety. And then you would um, be making a child abuse report if that were indicated um, from some kind of relationship and some kind of a trauma-informed discussion with them. Um, and that might occur at that visit, or if you feel like there's no immediate safety issues, it might occur at even a later visit. But that, you know, that that's kind of a recommended way to do the form. But you can choose, and we'll talk about it when we get into stuff about uh, screening over telehealth. It may be hard to do a de-identified de screening in some kinds of modalities. Um, for the adults, um, the ACEs screening really comes from the original study and the screening form that was developed by Kaiser. So here is the um, de-identified form for the parent of children zero to 12. So for children zero to 12, you would be screening the parent. Um, you can also screen a parent of an adolescent. Um, and rather than going over every question, this just gives you a link. And it's also possible to just Google ACEs Aware and kind of search around the, search around the website to find it. Um, and then this is the, adolescent self-report, and this is also de-identified, um, but there are identified forms, and you can see you add up the yes answers and you say how many there are in each section. So, um, any, I think we're doing well on time. Are there any questions in chat about these forms, or we can also, hand, we can also discuss them in the breakout rooms? Um, so again, this is the Pearl study. This grew out of a program that was developed by Dana Long at Children's Oakland. Um, and they're doing a randomized control trial about interventions uh, to reduce the effects of toxic stress. So they're actually doing the Pearl screener and they're also doing swabs um, to, to find out um, cheek swabs to develop uh, cortisol levels, to test cortisol levels and to see if cortisol levels, which are an indicator of chronic stress, if those, and they're going to be teaching coping skills and there's a kind of randomized control trial. So some people get a controlled intervention, some get the more fuller intervention and see if there are, are differences over time in cortisol levels of the children. So it's kind of exciting to see if there really are things we can do right in the moment. Um, so I wanted to talk about what we mean by trauma informed care. And it's really for uh, those of you who have taken the screener, um, the taken the training, um, know that the training actually has very little about the ACEs aware screening itself. It's really mostly about how to institute trauma-informed care um, in your institution and how to do a trauma-informed response to other kinds of screeners or to situations that come up in the clinic. It's a really great training. Uh, so even if you're not going to be somebody who's going to be billing for this, I really highly, highly recommend that you take the training. Um, but that it is required to take it in the test you've taken it before you can bill. Um, so um, we're not going to talk in depth about trauma-informed care. I just want to kind of mention what some of the principles are. And definitely for those who are going to be joining the Learning Collaborative, we're going to be going over it a lot more as to how it might um, be applied for ACEs screening. But um, some of the skills that are needed for both the provider and the clinic are awareness of trauma, safety, offering choices to families, uh, a collaborative approach to working with children and families, uh, demonstrating that you're a trustworthy provider, that you're going to, you know, you're going to disclose what you need to disclose. You're going to, you're not going to tell anybody unless you let the family know that you have to tell things, you inform them about reporting responsibilities, and then skills building for children, parents, and for the clinic. Um, and so in terms of a positive screening, um, we need to think about, you know, a, a approaching right away. So if there's a positive screen, we really want to respond to that screen right away and not kind of wait the family, make the family wait for, you know, several months to come back. We want to think about the right model for talking about those results. We want to think about being very aware of trauma in ourselves, actually, and in our clients and doing sort of a strengths-based uh, approach and engaging the family, which means we don't wanna do just the screening. We really wanna find out something about the family and the child and their strengths. Um, so it, the kind of traditional, the earlier kind of iteration of trauma-informed care was we were moving from what's wrong with you. If we thought about patients who were 
um, acting in ways that were difficult for us to handle in the clinic or were late or were not coming in very often or were just really, really upset. So moving from what's wrong with you to what happened to you, you know, what was going on in your life that you're having these kind of responses and really the more um, kind of the more current way to think about it is yes, what happened to you, but also what's right with you. What are your strengths? What are your coping skills? What are the supports that you have outside of the clinic uh, in your family and in your community? And how can we help strengthen them? Um, so the reason this is important, you could, you could see how doing the screen for a family that's pretty traumatized already and maybe not very trustful at the clinic could really lead to some increased fears about what would happen with the screen or possible, you know, worry that they would be stigmatized in some way because of the things that have happened. So the strength based approach really allows the person to feel known about more than they're just their negative life experiences. Um, so we also want to make sure because we, a lot of us work in situations where there's a lot of poverty, there's a lot of stress. Um, politically, we're living in a very difficult time. Uh, COVID has only added to all those stresses. And sometimes in order to continue as a provider uh, or somebody who works with children and families, we kind of armor ourselves so that we don't end, end up the day totally devastated. But sometimes that, you know, there's a difference between kind of surrounding ourselves with light in a kind of more, more kind of open way to kind of feeling like, okay, I just can't let myself really respond to people because it's just so overwhelming. So we want to want to make sure that we actually develop skills in ourselves for being able to engage with families in a way that gives them and us hope that these problems are not insurmountable and that uh, that they things can be managed and that there is help. Um, it increases the likelihood that strengths can be used during the service delivery process. So, you know, not everybody who screens positive is going to need a huge high level of services. Uh, and so we can have a discussion with families about kind of what's available to them. Um, and in research, this approach provides a richer understanding of the relationship between all of the research variables. So, you know, there's not just things that may have happened in people's past, but like what are the skills and what are the supports and what have people already done for themselves? Um, and it just helps us even as researchers think about increasing the power of our analysis of what to do. And just to go back for a second, those that this, these quotes come from um, Vanderkolk, who wrote a really incredible book, The Body Keeps a Score, about trauma, which I highly recommend to folks who haven't read it. Um, and then again, this is just an over, another overview uh, of being a trauma reactive agency to being a trauma-informed agency, to being a healing organization. So this is about us and how we operate in our schools, in our school-based health centers, um, in other school-related, in after-school programs. Um, so um, uh, a lot of folks that we have talked to about how they have, you know, instituting ACEs aware screening is that the really the first steps before you ever actually bring those questionnaires out is to really look at your own agency and look at, you know, Who's capable? Who's, who's, you know, how are we all going to be more capable? How are we going to be collaborative about this? Um, are we going to roll this out like everybody at once or a little bit at a time? Um, how are we going to do this in a way that actually protects us, given that we're all working under a lot of stress these days? Um, and how are we going to get to being a healing organization so that we can provide better care to families? Um, so what we'd like you to do before we break up in, and before we have a, just a little bit more discussion is to actually think about school-based schools and school-based health centers and doing ACEs screening in schools. What are the some potential strengths and challenges that you see in, the, in implementing ACEs screening in schools? If you can put them into chat, then we can kind of save them and address some of them in the uh, breakout sessions. Naomi, there and were uh, a couple of questions that came up about, around school nurses and public health nurses and whether they um, count under the sort of ACEs aware providers or whether they can do billing that would be covered under this? Do you know? So um, I don't know everybody, but there are a lot of public health organizations um, who actually can do ACEs aware screening and billing. Um, but in addition, I just learned about this, you know, through a, a, you know, sort of an email exchange looking for panelists. But I just found out that 
there's actually separate Medi-Cal money available for schools who want to do trauma-informed care. Uh, so it's not specifically ACEs. And um, I heard about it from uh, somebody in the Futures Without Violence organization. So I'm, you know, I'm happy to find out more, connect anybody who's got a question about that with that organization. And uh, this morning I actually looked, there is like a big variety and one of the links I put on an earlier slide with all the ACEs AWARE stuff um, actually says all the various people who can bill for ACEs AWARE screening. Um, so I think it's sort of complicated because um, uh, it is a little complicated, so I'm not completely sure that school nurses can be reimbursed for that screening, but they can be reimbursed for trauma-informed care. And we can kind of go back and look at that. Um, I might not have a break because I'm helping to facilitate a breakout session, but we can certainly get back to people after the session's over, or you can go in and kind of look yourselves. I mean, initially it was just kind of like, okay, it's, uh, you know, it's physicians and nurse practitioners and PAs and, um, psychologists and social workers and then more as time went on more and more folks have been uh been uh, given that kind of ability to screen and, and bill for it so possibly and stephanie did post in the chat um the link to aces aware has a whole um page on eligible providers so thank you stephanie yes. they do yes. have epsdt services providers in there early in periodic screening so it's possible that some of it falls under that um, but yes, we will do a little digging, but there are lots of great responses as far as strengths and challenges if people want to keep adding those into the chat. And this, for some reason, I'm not seeing the chat right now, but um, so, but I'm not, so I'm not going to look at it right until we get into the, into the breakout groups, but just that these are things that we came out with. Um, and Victoria, if you're looking at the chat, you can tell, tell us that there's others that have come up, but the strengths that we had seen uh, coming into this training are the potential outreach to all students. As we all know, many students are registered uh, as being eligible for a primary care provider under Medi-Cal, but they never go there or may go you know, once every few years. Um, the ability to see frequently for follow-up, to teach coping skills and check in about readiness to address. And this may speak to school nurses' ability to bill for actually trauma-informed care in terms of teaching coping skills. Um, uh, potential collaboration with school personnel, flexible connections with caregivers. And then the challenges, one of the challenges that I see as an adolescent provider is that the current model really emphasizes parental involvement. Um, and if you look in, you know, in terms of all the trainings that I've been to through ACEs Aware and the actual training that you have to take in order to bill, it really emphasizes uh, screening adults or screening children, including young ad adolescents with their parents. And there's not a lot of models out there for um, how we would screen and respond to that screening if we're screening a teen for confidential care whose parent might not know that they're coming in for confidential care. And that's certainly a big portion of what some school-based health centers do. So we actually need to help develop that model for addressing ACEs with adolescents and young adults alone. Um, and uh, involving stakeholders in the parent organization. So if you're in a school-based health center and you're, you want to do the screening and your parent FQHC or your parent organization isn't doing that, that can be an issue. Um, uh, and then involving school stakeholders in the school in terms of referrals and places to, um, places to make sure that youth are getting support if they need it. Um, Victoria, do you want to summarize any of the others? Or do we yeah, need to so actually go to it? A lot of concur um, with all of these, a lot of people acknowledging that the support and, and being able to work together um, to, to support children in the school setting is helpful. A lot of challenges around lack of resources as far as what to do with positives, where to refer them, um, and knowing, knowing how to apply you know, proper trauma-informed uh, care approaches. So yeah, really great echoing. And we'll, we'll discuss great. more in our breakout. Okay. Um, so these are the strengths and challenges that we have learned about just in general during the pandemic that we think apply to ACEs screening. So um, and some of the strengths are that, you know, a lot of research has shown that teens are actually more comfortable doing a screen on a computer, doing a screen on their like phone or a computer screen than they are in person or on paper. So it might be telehealth actually, it could be a benefit. Um, 
uh, we can be creative about questions. So, you know, there's a lot of issues uh, that people who are doing telehealth have, have noticed, and I'm sure those of you who are doing telehealth have also picked this up, is that, you know, youth may be in a very crowded situation where they don't have a confidential space and people are walking back and forth behind them, can hear them talking on the phone. Um, maybe the parent is actually in the room hovering close by, but that um, we can be sort of creative about questions. We can use chat functions if you're on any kind of video. Um, and uh, you can use yes or no questions for teens who are on a phone. Um, when confidentiality in the home is not really possible. Uh, some rural teens and teens who are isolated in other ways may actually have an easier time accessing health, telehealth than they did coming into the clinic. And that some, there's been some evidence that teens with social anxiety may actually feel more comfortable on a telehealth format than in the room. And then the you know, challenges are the same challenges that we've been kind of reading about in the news and the media about schools in general, but the shelter in place exacerbating health and educational inequities uh, youth without adequate cell or Wi-Fi connection may be cut out. De-identified ACEs screening might be a lot more difficult on some phone and web platforms. It's easier to say yes or no to each question. It's harder to remember all the questions and add them up. Uh, it might be more difficult to read the room, just as I can't read the room today. I can't see everybody's faces or your body language. You know, it's more difficult to read the room with the teen or the family uh, in terms of body language when you're talking on the phone or yeah, on Zoom or another kind of web platform. And then a lot of the youth in school-based health centers really see the people they're most comfortable with are the, the front desk, the medical assistants, the health educators, the folks that they can just kind of drop in and chat with. Um, and they often will be the folks who encourage youth to come see the provider or come perform formal screening. And we're not, you know, when the schools aren't open, we're not seeing those, those youth. They can't do that. There's a lot less ability to just drop in and get a walk-in appointment uh, than, than there is in person. So, and I'm sure you have much to add to that. Um, so I think strengths and challenges. Um, I'm not gonna go into this in detail because we're anxious to get into our breakout rooms, but just to show that the majority of folks who screen positive, and this was actually, you know, are not for these kinds of adverse experiences or traumas, are not gonna need a lot of services. Most people are gonna need you know, some support on well-being and resilience promotion, coping skills, healthy lifestyles. Um, and, um, you know, if, as we go up the ladder of the levels of support, you know, very few people are gonna need super high levels of support and even higher levels of support, it's only a small, small percentage. So in terms of feeling that we're overwhelmed by, we could be overwhelmed by positive ACEs, I think um, actually, um, we have to remember that there's a lot that we can provide to most people um, and then we can target folks who seem to really need a lot, lot higher level of support without overwhelming our resources. Um, and this is just kind of the ending slide of just um, if we think, especially if those of us who are working with younger children or working with um, adolescents and young adults who may be considering parenting themselves, um, that there are a lot of ways that we can prevent ACEs. Some of them are within our individual you know, capabilities, some of them are not, but we can advocate for more economic supports, uh, change social norms for supporting parents, uh, really help kids stay in school and provide quality education, enhancing parenting skills and coping skills, and uh, intervening to lessen harms and prevent future risk. So that's the end. I'm gonna stop sharing. So um, I see lots and lots of questions, which is great. Um, so are we ready to move? Are we, are there uh, any questions like right in the moment before we move? Or are we ready to move into our breakout groups? Yeah, so I'm just seeing something about in the chat about LEA is not being eligible for payment. But so if folks are interested, um, should contact us and we can refer you because apparently there is some actually uh, trauma, trauma informed care um, reimbursement that's available to those sites, which is really exciting. Okay, and if everyone's ready, we can move into our little breakout rooms.
So now you've all been invited to join, so please join um, your breakout room. And um, if you have not been assigned one, just wait, a, bear with us for a few moments while we get everybody assigned. Um,
I guess the workshop's over. Does anyone else know? Yeah, they were uh, telling us that we can go back and check out some of the brain breaks. So I guess this is just uh, time to collect ourselves, maybe check out some of the resources that they shared. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I would have sat here for another half an hour, probably. <laughs> yeah. All right. Bye, everyone. Where are we? Stephanie, you're on mute. You've muted yourself. <laughs> but I lost connectivity for the last, I think, 20 or 30 minutes. I just got back in. You're aware? I lost connectivity. I don't know if any of you did. Oh, OK. All right. Yeah, we were all. We're, um, We've all been in breakout groups and we um, just finished the breakout group and so that we're kind of our, our, our breakout group ended early so we are um, that part is closed and then Jessica and I are just coming back uh, to meet up with the other facilitators when their groups are done. Okay, so we're just waiting. Yeah, go. Okay. <laughs> go ahead, Jessica. <laughs> well, if you would, would you like me to uh, assign you to one of the other breakout rooms because they are still discussing things, so I can assign you to them, so you oh, can no, join I'm the just, conversation. I've missed so much. Yeah. So I you know, I'll just be on the tail end of theirs. So. Yeah, and I don't think we have anything, anything more planned for this room. So if you would like to go back to the main conference hall, poke around, get some participation points to be entered in a raffle, ah, do a little okay. brain break. There, there yeah, are those so things we'll available in the main conference. Then for the, yeah. To, to, no, that's yeah, we just it. ended. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Oh, what a bummer. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. It's okay. Yeah, I think my other colleagues are having issues too, so yeah. Yeah, I'm Hello. sorry. Okay, no problem. Bye. Bye. No. That was hard though. It's like, it's a big group, so it's hard to... Well, and nobody <laughs> has done it. Yeah. Right. I was um, like, no one <laughs> tried this? And it doesn't seem like it was like providers. Right. I think part that was part of the issue is like they were, it's a different audience. Um, I just Gosh. chatted with Susanna and Kelly. Susanna says her group is really engaged. Oh, good. Kelly said theirs is kind of limited. Well, at least we got I'm one. A lot of people. Yeah, it's <laughs> a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Should we see who is Meli, Melia23? I'm guessing they maybe stepped away. I would guess. We can put them in the, um, the waiting breakout room. room. Or the waiting room. Or a breakout room. Yeah, yeah. yeah let's assign them. Put in waiting room. <laughs> So, <laughs> like, do we just wait? Oh, wait.
Who's uh, R R B? Roberge. <laughs> Are you back in the room? Can you hear us? Okay. Just put them. <laughs> Should we let them know? Can we message? And this is so cool. I'm getting all these like things I didn't know I could do. So we message them and just say like. Would you like to join a breakout room or um, you can otherwise? message everyone in the waiting room? Yes. Susanna so says we can join that. We can join Susanna's room. Oh yeah, that would be fun. I'll just wait for them. To stop. <laughs> okay. I mean, I would like to hear when more people are actually participating. I mean, that was like painful. <laughs> like okay. <laughs> But it sounds like Stephanie Smith would be a good person um, to follow up with. Uh, I got from her too. They're doing a lot of Aces and Wear stuff. Um, yeah. All right, I'm not hopping on. Which one's Susan? Yeah. Because the, the people oh, in the waiting room are not. Oh, if you go to breakout oh, room. I think we're being recorded right now too. Oh. It's only giving me the option to go to breakout room two. Oh, because you were assigned. Here, let me unassign you. Okay. I will, I mean, I'll try. Let's see, where are you? Okay. Oh, I can move you. Would you like to, who's Susanna's, one or three? Uh, Susanna's with Victoria. I don't know which one she's in. I don't remember either. Let me have to look at the name. Victoria, okay, so three, room three. Okay, all right. Come okay, on. so now I think you can join it. <laughs> okay. I'll try to join it too. Okay. Oh,
Hi, Mary Jane. <laughs> Stephanie Conosa, it's been a while. <laughs> I think you're muted. <laughs> Can't hear me. I was sending an invitation to the wellness providers right now for this thing. Yay! Cool. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a crazy situation. You know, I wish that people could, um, you know, just boom, do it and it lay it out because it makes the most sense in the world. It's what everybody needs, mm -hmm. but you know, like again coupling all the other resources and issues and concerns for people right now it's like whoa yeah, yeah. it's a lot